Here we are again, Paul. The chapter one of your new normal ebook describes how the baby boomer generation has led to sustained high growth for decades. And this is now coming to an end. Why should people read the next chapter? Without exaggeration, Will, I think it's probably the most important article that they will read this year about the future of their business, and possibly also about the future of their own personal finances. Why is that? Because it looks at what's happened to demand over the past 20 or 30 years. It looks at what the policymakers are doing to try and return us, as they see it, to that pattern of growth. And it says very clearly, this isn't going to happen. We aren't going to go back to the last 30 years of sustained growth. We're going in a new direction. And if people read the article, they may not agree with the conclusions particularly, but I don't think you could argue with the facts that we present there. What are these policymakers doing wrong then? They've been trying to stimulate pent-up demands, but they've been going wrong. The fact is, Will, we don't believe there is any pent-up demand. The pent-up demand came because over the last 40 years, in the Western world, we saw a growth in the number of baby boomers in the 25 to 54 age group. Those are the people who buy houses, buy cars and electronics. The growth in their numbers from 279 million to 392 million, 44% over 40 years. So every time interest rates went up, more baby boomers were entering into that 25 to 54 age group. Every time they came down, more of those boomers were ready to buy. But now the number of people in those baby boom generation in the 25 to 54 age group is reducing and unfortunately the generation behind is simply too small to keep that momentum going. So there is no such thing anymore as pent-up demand. So Paul, what effects are the mistakes of policymakers having on the global economy right now? I believe they're making it far worse rather than making it better. Of course they're trying to make it better, but what they're doing is they're ignoring the demographics and demographics drive demand. So the number of people who are 25 to 54 in the West is now declining. Therefore, we are not going to see more demand or returning demand for housing, for autos and for electronic goods, with the exception of course of the iPad and one or two niche products like that. That demand can't come back because the people aren't getting too old like myself, they're 55 plus, they don't need all those things anymore. Equally, the emerging economies like China, look at China, slowing now very fast indeed. Why? Because there is no export demand, because the Western world simply doesn't need their goods anymore. We've got to recognise it's a big change underway. So, so Paul, this sounds like a bit of a disaster for the chemical industry, this, this terrible de sharp decline in demand growth. I don't think it's a disaster. And I think that we've got a major number of new opportunities ahead of us. Once we focus on those, we've been held aloft by a liquidity fuel boom over the past couple of years from central banks, but it hasn't worked. It's simply given us a lot more debt and you can see the mess that we're in in financial markets around the world at the moment. But if we wake up and look at what the numbers are telling us, they show us that the 55 plus age group is now going to be 36% in a few years time of the Western world. Now, we don't know anything about this generation because it's never lived before. These people would have been dead at 65. Average life expectancy was 66 years old 50 years ago. So this is wonderful that these people have now got an extra 10 or 15 years life expectancy. Let's spend our time, instead of trying to go back, let's go forward, let's look at what these opportunities are equally. Let's look at the poorer people in China, let's look at the poorer people in the emerging economies. What can we do to boost their standard of living for the very first time? They've got a little bit of money, let's make some goods to supply them, rather than making more and more large Mercedes for fat bankers. Why can't we do something a bit more useful, just as we used to do when the growth surge got underway 20 or 30 years ago? So it sounds like the industry is going to have to be a lot smarter about um, innovative products and so on for housing and construction or automotive, these, these key end you say, industries. Yeah, absolutely. I think we've, we've been a very smart industry, but we've been held back by the short-termism of the financial markets, and it really needs us now to break free of those shackles and instead say, let's start planning this business for the next 5, 10, 15 and 20 years. This is what the great companies of today did 20 or 30 years ago. That's why they're the great companies of today. 
we need the great companies of tomorrow to start taking the same approach. And I'm absolutely confident, Will, from my meetings around the world, that this is already starting to happen. So whilst you can look at the face of it and say, oh, it's very depressing, it isn't. It's very optimistic. And if I was coming into the chemical industry today, I would be wildly optimistic about the prospects ahead. Thanks very much, Paul. Thank you, Will.